to be rejoice and be glad in it, man. That is it, man. That is it. All right. Amen. That's the spirit. That's the spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> God is good. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. I am. How can I say this? So, two weeks of talking about the same topic, you have to study every single day to make sure that you don't repeat yourself. Or repeat the same thing you said the day before. And um, for those of you who take notes, so for those of you who have a very good memory, you can easily identify when someone is repeating themselves and saying the same thing and repeating the same lesson two days in a row. So the challenge for anyone to speak about one topic for two weeks is to ensure that they have a vast composite of information to draw from. And two... Ensure that whatever they said the day before or days before, they don't repeat themselves. Fortunately, this topic is a vast topic in God's word. But I feel sympathy for anyone who gets a topic that they can't find all over God's word. Because you're going to repeat yourself every morning. But repeating yourself, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, sometimes we need to hear the same message over and over again to really get it into our spirit. Amen. Yeah, I'm sure someone agrees with me on that one. Amen, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Amen. So as I said before, we have today and two more days left. And fortunately, we are going to be learning different things about God's righteousness today and the upcoming two days. This morning... We are going to be talking about the transformation of God's righteousness and how it relates to us and what it means. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians that we all know very well. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Or literally, a new creation. The old things have passed away. And the new things have come. To explain that passage briefly. The old things that have passed away. Are your affections and your love for sin. And the new things that have come are your affections and your love for God. And every Christian can identify themselves with this truth in that when you became a Christian, when you were born again, you had a new found passion for the things that are holy and a new found Amen. hatred for the things that are unholy. Amen. An, ex Amen. an example would be when you were born again and you sinned, you felt bad. Why? Because you no longer like the sin. You no longer indulge in the passion of the sin. Because of the remainder of your flesh and because your flesh remains fallen and it has desires that are in contravention to your spirit. You are going to slip sometimes, but when you do, because you hate your sin, you're going to feel bad about it. Which brings concern for anybody who says they are a Christian, but they feel no guilt when they sin. And they feel they feel good when they sin. And they actually love their sin and claim that they love God as well. Amen. So, it's a That's very big hour. problem. Though. Right, right. It's a very, very big problem there. They, they go to church and they put on the appearance. They, they dress like a Christian. They mm -hmm. talk like a Christian. They, they know the Amen. jargon. They, they, they know mm -hmm. how to make noise and how to praise. But after Sunday is over and Monday morning arrives, they go back to 
their passions and their love for sin. So I want to talk to us this morning about the transformation. Amen. The transformation of God's righteousness in that God's act of transforming the believer is an act of righteousness and the transformation that the believer goes through is a process whereby God makes them righteous. Now, I have to distinguish between two doctrines in Christianity. Number one is the declaration of righteousness. And number two is the transformation of righteousness. Declaration of righteousness simply means that God declares you to be righteous because you have been granted the righteousness of Christ to your record. You have a perfect record because Christ lived a perfect life and that righteousness was imputed to you, accounted to you. Remember, we went over this the other day with Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So Abraham is righteous the same way every believer is righteous when we believe God. We have the same righteousness. But there is another aspect, a process whereby God makes you righteous in that you are continually transformed, you are continually made holy, you are continually changed into the image of Christ. And I want to give you some passages so that you can, you know, meditate on after we're done with this lesson and so on and so forth. In Ephesians chapter 4, Verse 22, we hear these words. In reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old man, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So remember, anybody in Christ is a new creature. The old man has passed away. The new man has come. And we realize in this passage that this new man is being transformed in the likeness of Christ. And Christ, who is the perfect representation of God, as the Bible rightly says in Ephesians, well, not Ephesians, uh, Hebrews chapter one, where it says he is the invisible image. Well, rather, he is the the perfect representation of his nature who upholds all things by the word of his power. That's Hebrews one, verse three. And when you go to Colossians chapter one, it says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. This means, brethren, that Jesus Christ represents God perfectly. And because we know that God is sinless and God is perfect, Jesus Christ, if he represents God, will be sinless and will be perfect. We are being transformed into the likeness and image of Christ in a process, a progressive transformation. That is why when we look at Romans chapter 8, it just came to mind when speaking about this transformation. We read about those who are children of God and those who have the Spirit of God. And it makes reference in verse 15. You have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. So we are children of God. And this reality of our adoption is the basis of our transformation, because, brethren, we have been adopted out of a family, and placed into another family. And I'm sure that we all know what family we were adopted out of. 
that family is the the as as the Bible says, we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Mm -hmm. Bible says that those who are a friend of the world make themselves an enemy of God. The Bible also says that those who practice sin, First John chapter three, are children of the devil. And the Bible says that those who are dead in sin, there is a spirit working in them, working in the sons of disobedience. So we know, brethren, that there is a grace that has been given to every individual believer. And this grace <clears throat> is the transformation of righteousness. And just to give you some something to look back on. It is my position that every Christian, when they are born again, there are sins that they participated in that they did not immediately stop doing. But over time, as time progresses and as time goes by, those sins started to become less and less pervasive in your life to the point where you no longer do those sins anymore. But there are sins that you struggle with. There are sins that you have challenges with. But as time goes by, those sins are shed and you no longer have a passion for them anymore. That is the transformation that you go through. That is the transforming power of God's righteousness, whereby his righteous action changes you into a righteous individual. And at this point, I have to make reference to something that um, if you have not heard of it yet, you're going to hear of it somewhere. Maybe not the term, but the concept. It's called sinless perfectionism. It's a doctrine that states that an individual Christian can reach a state in this life while they are alive when they no longer sin anymore, when they are free from conscious sin. And it's possible for them to not commit any sins while they are alive. This doctrine may sound um, absurd, but there are individuals who actually believe this. And the passages that they go to are, for example, Matthew 5, verse 48. They say, this passage says, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And they go to 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, where it says, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. And the other one is, um, first Peter chapter one, verse 16, which says that be holy as I am holy. And then they say these words, see, God says you must be perfect. Therefore you can. And God says, cleanse yourself of all defilement. Therefore you can. And God says, be holy. That must mean that you can. No, you can't do it on your own. God forbid. <laughs> there it is. There it is. There it is. But they take these passages and they say, if God says that we can do it, well, if God says we should do it, then that must mean we can do it. And and um, every time I encounter someone who says this to me, I ask them, are you perfect? They say, no, no, I'm not. I, I ask them, have you cleansed yourself of all defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God? Have you done that? They say, no. Then I ask them, are you holy as God is holy? They say, no. So then I ask them, so if you're not there yet, yeah, why do God. you believe that you can get there in this life? And they, and they say, well, I may not be there, but I'm sure somebody is. I'm like, wait a minute. Okay. Do you know anybody who has achieved this? Well, no, but I know they're out there. And I'm like, come on. It, it is it, it is like sometimes people look for impossible things to believe 
And because of the impossibility of it, they believe it. It's like they see believing absurdity to be a virtue. Because this is so hard to believe, by believing it, I am exhibiting that I have amazing and tremendous faith. And I'm thinking, how is that virtuous? How is it virtuous for you to believe in the impossible? How is it virtuous for you to believe in something that the Bible doesn't even support? And when you press them more, they bring you to the Old Testament and they say that in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, the Bible says, walk before me and be perfect. And this is when God was speaking to Abraham. And they go to Genesis 6, verse 9, where it says that Noah was a just man and perfect. And I asked them this question, was Abraham perfect? They say, yes, you see, the pastor says it. And then I said, okay, was Abra was Noah perfect? And they say, yes, the pastor said it. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. If Abraham was perfect, then why did he lie to Abimelech? They scratched their head. And I'm like, okay, see? So if he's perfect and he lied, that, that, must mean, that must mean that this verse must mean something else other than being sinlessly perfect, right? You, you make them think. And the next one, the Bible says Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. Okay, did Noah drink and get drunk? Yes, he did. So apparently... These men are the only example you can point to of perfect individuals, and they were not sinlessly perfect, which means that this doctrine falls Amen. on its head. It falls on its head. Amen. But unfortunately, brethren, sometimes even though you can show these things from Scripture, people will still hold on to their traditions and not let it go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but let me tell you, None of us are sinlessly perfect. No, but we will be, we will be through Christ Jesus. We will be on this day. Let me show you. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Behold, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be we know that when he appears we will be like him because we will see him just as he is as he is that is when brethren that is when amen. we will be sinlessly perfect amen as far as i'm concerned we don't see him yet he hasn't appeared in the sky yet. He has not appeared yet, and we haven't seen him in the sky yet. So we have not completed the transformation of being like him, which is sinlessly perfect. We no reach yet, but we're on our way. We're on our way. Now, if this brings any discouragement to anyone that... You cannot be sinlessly perfect. Therefore, you shouldn't pursue holiness. You shouldn't pursue righteousness because you're saying, no matter what I do, I will not be perfect. Don't say that. What you should say is this. Even though my righteousness and my transformation of righteousness will never end in this life, it must be increasing in this life. Don't be a Christian who just stays a, 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 a in, in a static position where you don't increase in holiness, you don't increase in righteousness, because your righteousness must be increasing in this life as a display and as a obvious sign that you are truly a believer. True Christians increase in righteousness and increase in holiness. This is a characteristic that belongs to every single one of us. That this process, brethren, of holiness and righteousness continually increases. Now let me bring you to some passages to bring this out some more. 
so that we can all know that if we are truly believers and we don't practice sin, but sometimes we stumble, we stumble in many ways, the Bible says, and sometimes we stumble while we are struggling not to stumble. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46, when they sin against you, do not be angry, but forgive them. It says again in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 36, when they sin against you and they come to this temple, accept them and don't turn them away. We have in Psalm chapter 143, verse 2. Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no man living is righteous. We also have in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20, it says, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. This one is the most clearest I can read. Not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and never sins. The only person who did that was Jesus Christ. And finally, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And the following verse, just a little further down, verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Brethren, to walk around and say that we have no sin, to walk around and say that we have not sinned, is to make God out to be a liar and to show that his word is not in us. That is why in every single one of our prayers, we always say, Father, forgive us of our sins and our trespasses and our debts, because even though we are being transformed, we still stumble. But we have confidence in our king, confidence in our God, that even though we stumble at times, we are still in a process of transformation whereby we are being made righteous. But nonetheless, we are righteous because of the righteousness that God has declared upon us and imputed to us. And we can always have confidence in our king. Hence, brethren, the transformation of righteousness. I want us all to know that there is a progressive nature in our Christian life whereby our architect, our God, is continually transforming us. He is the potter, we are the clay. He continues to transform us into the image of Christ. That is why when someone is a Christian for a long time, if you knew them when they just became a Christian, you can see a transformation, you can see a change. If you knew them when they just became a Christian, when they were a baby Christian and they, they had some struggles and then you, you see them 10 years later, you notice a big difference, a growth where there are things that no longer bother them and there are different things that they struggle with. And this is something we can all thank God for, for all those individuals on this platform who God has transformed, God has changed. And God is continually changing. Those on, platform, th those on this platform who have been through that can always say, God, thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love. And I will close by saying these words. We are not who we ought to be. But thank God, we are not who we were. Amen, brethren. Amen. 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 We are not Amen. yet who we should be. Amen. But thank God we are not Amen. who we yeah. used to be. Who used to be. Amen. Not yet who we should be, but we are not who we used to be. By God's grace. And I can say that of myself. I am not where I should be. And I'm not, not yet who I should be. But it also, but it is also true that I am not who I used to be. I don't want to see that man again. I don't want to hear about him again. I'm not who I used to be. And it is the same thing with everybody here. 
You're not who you should be because who you should be is perfect. And that is the destination of your transformation. You're on your way there. But even though you're not there, brethren, here's the good news. You are not who you used to be. Thank God for that. Amen. Amen. I'm now going to Amen. have the closing prayer and the benediction. I'm going to ask my dear sister, I don't know if I'm saying the name right, Goli. Is that Goli? Can you do the closing prayer for us, my sister? And then I'll do the benediction. <laughs> 